Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Charles Bonus, and I'm uh, very pleased to be here with these two fine educators, uh, Tom Rogerson and uh, Irfan Latif. Sorry about my pronunciation. Um, you're quite good friends, aren't you? How do you, how do you know each other? I'm not, I can't remember. <laughs> we go back a long way. And um, we have just sh got a, a passion for education, uh, both from a boarding perspective, but also from a um, technology perspective as well. So we're looking at ways in which we can inculcate AI and uh, technology into education uh, to make it much more accessible uh, to children. You've just hired a robot, haven't you, Tom? So you've just hired a robot. Uh, that's another story it's for another a, it's time. A, it's but a not really telegraph, to be believed. But so, yeah. um, but your your, your backgrounds are, uh, in education are, are quite different, aren't they? Because Tom, you're, you've always really focused on the prep school world. I went to a state school up until the age of eight, and I taught in state schools in London for the beginning of my career. Yeah. So I've I've had a, uh, a uh, bit what, of experience. What, what, what age did you? Um, did you teach, not age were you? In, in, you know, in London, it yeah. was secondary. Yeah. Which subject? Um, English and history. Yeah. Now, if I, you're, you're a chemist. That's correct. Uh, I uh, graduated uh, yeah. not far from here at King's in London. Yeah. And ke chemists, I'm not a chemist. So I was exceptionally bad at chemistry. I suspect you weren't very good at it either, Tom, or am I completely wrong? Chemistry? Yes. I think my teachers are a bit, um, yeah. It's a very linear subject, so hopefully we're going to have Surprised. some well-structured, linear, well-thought-through answers from a fan. You certainly uh, will. Um, so why, I mean, I, we, we'd very much like to hear what we, we, we can say to help you, you as the audience, but why, why move at all from, from state to in, independence? What, 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 what's the thinking behind it? Um, and do you, do, you, do you think this is an issue that's becoming more prevalent? Do you think more people are um, mixing state and um, pr private? So I have a very strong relationship with a lot of the state school heads in my area. I've created a group called the Bucken Group, which is uh, a supportive group, but it's also we get together, we talk about innovation, we talk about science, uh, we talk about STEM. And so I've got a pretty good pipeline of um, understanding uh, between the, the, the state system, especially the primary state system at the moment, and uh, what's happening in their, in their world. And, and if so, I, you, you, you've moved from, two, sorry, sorry you, you've moved from two, one very different school to, to DLD. To tell us about that. Yeah, very much so. I, I went to state primary as, yeah. a, a, as a boy. Uh, and then moved into independent education. So I moved at the age of 11. Uh, but no, before I came to DLD, which is a uh, independent boarding school in London, I ran a state school in Somerset. Uh, it's a very country uh, school, uh, a boarding school, uh, but it was a state school. And um, I had five wonderful years there, uh, but very, very different to the um, independent sector. Uh, I learned a lot uh, there and the sort of things that I could do uh, but also the same, you know, what I couldn't do and the resources in terms of what I had in front of me and what I couldn't do in terms of, uh, you know, providing a, a fantastic education uh, for the children in my care. And what would you say the advantages are of going to a state school? Coming to a state school? Go, well, go, going to a state school. Not, not necessarily um, what, moving, but just going. One of the advantages of going to a state school, no. staying in a state school, is that... Um, I feel like this, this local community is really, really strong yeah. around, especially primary schools. So the community around Colgate Primary School, which is my old school, is really, really strong. And I, I, I really love that uh, sort of uh, a local community feeling, that cohesion that can occur. So you have your fate, and the fate is very often based around the local, um, you know, whatever, the local town hall, but it's always the primary school who are doing something or running something. That's, I think that's the main... F-E-T-E. F yeah. 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 So, okay, okay, uh, yeah. So, yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, if I, it's, a state boarding school sounds like a massive freebie to me in a beautiful part of England. Um, <laughs> it certainly isn't a freebie. Um, it's, uh, the, the boarding part is paid privately uh, by parents. Right, right. 
How much is that? Uh, and that could be up to about uh, twelve to 13,000 a year. Okay, yeah. yeah uh, so right. considerably cheaper than my uh, independent colleagues. Yeah. Uh, but the actual education is paid for by the state. Yeah. So I cannot, could not use any of the money that I had in boarding to buy geography books, for example. Yeah. Uh, I had to use the money that was given to me by the state system in order yeah. to provide yeah. those. And that was where the tension came, uh, where I couldn't provide everything that I wanted to, having experienced um, education in the independent because, sector. Yeah. Uh, that was tough. Because DLD, where you are now, is, is quite a commercial being, isn't it? And, and do, you, do you find that more restrictive? in terms of what you're allowed to do? No, because now I have the resources. Remember, when I was in the state sector, I was working in pence. Now that I'm in the independent sector, I'm working in pounds. So hundredfold yeah. in terms of my budgets and, uh, and working with those. Working at, my, working at that state school has really informed me on how I can best use my resources uh, at my disposal now in, in the independent sector. And I'm yeah. so much more, uh, how can I put it, I'm so much more careful with money going forward, even though I've got quite a lot of it in terms of how I can spend it. Got but it, I want yeah. to make sure that uh, the money that are, are generated through fee income, which is from parents here, yeah. uh, really does uh, bring value for money yeah, to yeah. the education that their sons or daughters experience. Yeah, so well, if we just turn to, if, if you like, the sort of standard conundrum, which I've, I've just had two parents on a stand ask exactly the same question. That if you're heading for one of the... Um, academically competitive entry point schools in London, say, or even outside London at 11 or 13, are you disadvantaged by having gone to a to state school? Well, probably in some respects. What do you do about it? What do the schools think about it? What sort of dispensations do they give you? How empathetic are they? Uh, what, what's your view on this? What, what, what should your strategies be? Should you be looking I, at I tutoring? Think, should you be looking I, I at I think moving? you're only, yeah. yeah. To answer a question, I think you're only disadvantaged. If you're at a state school, if you're at a primary school, I think you're only disadvantaged by your own pro proactivity. There are so many free resources out there that can prepare you very beautifully for entry to um, any number of the academic um, schools in London or anywhere, or Cotsmoor. Or it, it's, but it's, isn't it's, you have to be proactive, and yeah. you need to speak to people who have lots of knowledge. Um, we have Jason here, for example, who's from Think Academy. This is called the Think Academy uh, um, Theatre. And they're providing maths tuition for free. And it's all about having your, am I right? Partly right. So it's all about having your ears wide open. We've been putting on some AI conferences, which have been unbelievably well received in the, uh, in the wider sense. Is that, did, did, did you know about the uh, conferences? You've seen it. So um, it's all about, and they're free. And it's, they're free because we're a bit excited and we're overexcited and we're giving away free stuff. And have, we, we just want to have a brilliant conversation. You've just got to have your ears open and you've got to be, uh, have your eyes wide open and you've got to be listening. There's so much stuff you can do out there that's free. And I don't think you need to be disadvantaged just because you're at a state school. Okay, in fact, so, in so, other ways, right. you're advantaged, I think. T Tom, by the way, I've known for a long time, about 20 years. And I, I think he runs what, for me, is the, my favourite school in England. I think it's an absolutely fabulous school, of course. We're on your, Thank you, Charles. one of the great educators of your generation. I, I don't say that lightly, but I'm going to disagree with you because children have a bad habit of going to school because they have to. So d however much you can supplement, there are these critical hours, you know, which are the key parts of the day, when I have parents coming to me and saying, well, the child's bored or... We, just, we love the school, but it's just not going to get us where we want to get to. And I, I'm not, just despite my background, I'm not a strong advocate of independent schooling at all. What would you think about that, Afan? I think what we, need, what we need to do as an education sector is provide a curriculum now for Generation Alpha. And that's for that's, uh, many of the children who are sitting in this audience now. Generation Alpha are those kids who were born in, entirely in the 21st century. And they have an incredible relationship with technology. And we need to see how we can change our education system, which is exactly what Tom is doing down at Cottesmore, how we can make sure that that is working for their benefit. That's why they feel that they have to go to school or they're bored uh, and they don't want to go to school. So at DLD, we have completely transformed our uh, year nine program 
and our Key Stage 4 program, which we now call Key Stage More, because we're offering subjects such as esports and business entrepreneurship at 13 and 14 years old, because that's what the kids are now going to be studying for, for the jobs that have yet to be created. Remember, when we were at school, we were being trained to go into law, architecture, um, doctor, etc. Now we're looking at jobs such as cloud consulting, or we're looking at big data scientists. And so we need to make sure that our curriculum reflects, actually reflects those sort of skills now that those kids are going to need for the jobs that have yet to be created. So here's my uh, pitch at getting a bursary at DLD, so we'll keep a note of this. I, I, I'm very fond of DLD. I used to live behind it, the, the old DLD in, in uh, Pembroke Square. And I, I, despite you changing hands a few times, I, the, the culture is still very strong, and it's very individually orientated and individually tailored, and it's, it's w well worth looking at, actually, um, and considering very seriously. But, Thank you. But the fact remains that we have a system where schools that are household names, one you know particularly well, uh, have high points to entry, like it or not, in year six, and they have a lot of advantages these schools and is it is it worth prejudicing the chance of getting to the school you want to get to when you're 11 or 13 by going to a state school first How, however great that state school is and the community point i think is extremely important because you, are you saying you're not disadvantaging yourself at all i would say no because Somewhere like DLD is very inclusive, it's very open, it's very diverse, uh, and so we would welcome any uh, one from any different background. And we have systems in place, as you said, DLD has been around for nearly 100 years, it still retains that ethos of individual and, and personalization. So we would be looking at to ensure that all our children, regardless of what background they've come from, state, independent, um, yeah. creed, color, whatever, that they assimilate well into our ethos and our understanding within the school network. But you, you, you have to get quite specific. Well, let's say uh, you're... Because, uh, I'd say you're, you're maths, you're, you're, maths, for example. Okay, yeah, yeah. So you have somebody from uh, a state school, it's come to Cotsmoor, let's say, from um, a state school in Shepherd's Bush. It's quite a famous, uh, I'm not going to say the name of it, but it's quite a famous primary state school that prepares children absolutely beautifully, and they come to Cotsmoor. What primary schools are exceedingly good at in the UK is number maths, very purist number maths. What I find is that when they come, that they haven't been exposed to so much uh, word math, so you translating words into uh, the, the, the mathematics, also um, geometry, also visual maths. And so these, if you know this, this is something you can plug. And I think this is, this, this is where... What about that, English? What do, you, do, you, do you find that there's a vocabulary I think they come difference? very literate. They arrive very literate. Yeah, yeah. Um, and th there aren't quite such specific areas um, as maths. Maths is really specific and we found it often. So can you, um, as, as a guide, tell me r roughly what sort of number of children who come to you come from state schools as opposed to... I'd have to defer to my registrar who's in the audience. Um, but or or let me ask you another I question. I can't, I can't is, it, is it quite usual for you to have uh, applicants who succeed to the high entry point schools, the, the, the Eatons, yeah. the Winchesters? Absolutely. Sevens? We had uh, two boys who came from uh, St. Stephen's. Uh, and they came to Cotsmoor and they went off to Harrow. And so they and will, were will, at no disadvantage Will a school whatsoever. like Harrow give you dispensation and, uh, because you, you haven't been into a sort of cramming type independent I think they school. were given the equal opportunity as everybody else. We, so, we, it has to be said, there are, like the maths piece yeah. and uh, the languages as well sometimes is. A, a school, a state school can be amazing at languages. Sometimes... Where, where there's somebody leaves and there's not necessarily a linguist in the school, I think the languages can be uh, an area where we need to develop a bit more. And, and what so about supporting it, extracurricular activities? What, what specific well, I part? mean, would, would you say that there's a definitive advantage of an independent school for the extracurricular activities or not? Uh, it's, a, it's a yes. Um, yeah. that's, that's where, so I, I believe that the local, to us, the local state schools are wonderful, wonderful establishments. And the leaders are empathetic, delightful, and I would recommend all, of, all five of them in our group. We have 
much longer school days, we have smaller class sizes, and there are advantages to having smaller and larger class sizes, but we have smaller class sizes, and we have the ability to do many hundred things. Um, and it, this is where the conversation becomes uh, um, you know, uh, slightly more tricky, because we're a rural school. Uh, we have a golf course. We have a lake in which people can do paddle boarding. So it, it's this point where you spring away from an argument which is, you know, which is, you know, uh, not defensible, but is, uh, it, it gets a bit more tricky because th that's where we, th it starts to pull away. It's the other things, it's not the academic. I'm very passionate about um, academic rigor, but I don't think that's where success comes from. I think success comes from a broader approach to education. It comes from being able to communicate with other humans. It comes from being, uh, being not forced, but being, um, you know, it, it being normal to be put into positions of uh, responsibility and leadership. And that can be on the sports pitch. It can be on the th in the theatre, on okay. the stage. It can be uh, in many different on the golf course. As I say it can be yeah. on the debating so, team, the right. chess team. And so these leadership. Okay constant leadership yeah. experiences probably are well, where if, it if starts I can just present the counter arguments I, I find I'm sure you have some extraordinary opportunities in the extracurricular sphere as well but let's let's get down to real business here because there's a, a huge problem with perceived huge problem I don't think it's that big with contextualized admissions to Oxbridge uh, but it does strike me that there's a culture of amateur heroic failure in, in, in English schools which has taken a little bit too far it's the taking part, not how good you are at something, even if you kill yourself on the way. But seriously, you go up to Oxford or Cambridge to read a subject. So if you're spending far too much of your time not reading, and your competitors who go to a state school and come home at 3.15 every afternoon, and they've got free weekends when they don't have to be doing house plays and house country runs and um, AI classes and all of that kind of stuff, can be reading classical literature. Um, that, that's surely an advantage, isn't it? For me, it's all about well-being. And that's where we started at DLD. It's about putting in all the structures in place to ensure that your sons and daughters are in a position to be able to uh, study hard, uh, but at the same time uh, that their mental health is being looked after. We've just come through a terrible time uh, through covid uh, and what measures have we put in place in order to make sure that our kids are prepared in order to take that next step, whether it be A-levels uh, at a state school or at uh, an independent school, uh, to then go on uh, to go and study at uh, some of those elite universities such as uh, Oxford and Cambridge. And it is about making sure that their well-being and their mental health is as best as it can be so that they can thrive in any situation. Yes, and you're right. The, you know, the universities now are looking at state school entry and looking at how they can increase their state school entry. Uh, but are the state schools doing enough? And I'm you know, going on to, to what Tom said in terms of what uh, they're being offered from a pastoral point of view and that co-curricular uh, point of view, which is so important in building the whole person. Let me ask you a question. Now. Oh, Tom, you're, you're a very talented musician. Here, here this man played a guitar. It's wonderful. But do you, do you think you I'll need to I'll take it, but that's a slight exaggeration, yeah. Well, that's, it's all going into the... the Enthusiastic the, guitarist the, and singer. The, the, the bursary tick box. But tell me, do you think to be a specialist in something, you have to be more of a generalist first? I have an enormous passion. I don't know well, no, if this I is mean, to if do you, with if, um, if you're going to end up being a, a, a classical musician, for example, a, a professional musician or a professional sports person or... A, a, a dedicated neurologist or something quite specialist. Do you think the, the, the direction, the pathway to get there can be really quite specialist or do you think you need to have the kind of breadth of activity or you, 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 let's say you would benefit from having that breadth of activity that you do certainly, it seems, receive off the shelf at an independent school I think there are whereas two, at a state school you'd have to go and find it yourself. It's all to do with your vision. If you want to become a, a very specific professional I think, and you know you're going to become that specific professional, I think, of course, you have to specialise and do that specific thing um, over a long period of time. But a school like Cotsmore gives you options, and I think this is the thing. You, you, it, 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 you are studying your English, you are um, going out and playing cricket, you are 
going and fishing in the lake. You're doing all these things, and it's making you have a very broad uh, view of life and you, you, all these different subjects. You're studying theology, you're studying philosophy, you're studying computing, coding, AI potentially you're having a look at or debating about having a conversation about AI. The breadth of your uh, education guides you more towards lead, a leadership role in the future. So it depends on uh, which why, route you why, want to what, take. Your, why do you think that? Why do I think that? What's, what's the link between leadership and doing lots of activities? Having, having a breadth of a view and becoming a leader is hugely important for empathy and understanding a wide variety of what issues would you intellectually. Say about that? I think it's about confidence yeah, and it's yeah. what the, the sector provides those children with confidence to be able to go and make a mistake, yeah. uh, but at the same time being in a safe environment so that they can learn from their mistakes. We're not going to get things right all the time, and I think our yeah, sector yeah. allows for those mistakes to happen uh, and for our children to learn from those. It's striking a balance, isn't it? Can, let's have some, I haven't got very much time, I'm afraid. But it's, 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 does anyone have any questions? Do, do you have any answers, do you think? Or not? Hi. So. Can you hear me? Yeah. So, two questions, actually. Uh, so, the first one, um, and I think you roughly uh, slightly touched upon it is that state schools are having now a bigger opportunity for top universities what i heard and i don't know how much of it is true that about 70 people or students will now come from state schools and then 25 percent from independent schools that's the first question i want to understand your view on that and then the second one and there's an option to do eight level class exams versus 11. Uh, I would like to get your point of view, which is better for a child, because I do believe that it's a lot of pressure for the child. So is it better to do it at eight? Is it better to wait till he's 11? So I think both of us need to answer the first question. So can I just remember what the first question was yeah. about? Yeah, so what, what we heard is that um, the kids that comes from state schools have a bigger um, oh, yeah. opportunity. So, so I. I, I'm not, I run a prep school, it goes up to 13, so I'm not qualified really to um, empathize well, you, you, and answer it. But you, I'll, you, you I'll, I'll, I'll just quickly you. answer what, what, how I feel. I believe this to be an enormous opportunity for universities. That's, that's my view of it. Oxford and Cambridge are not the only universities in, in the UK. Yep. There are universities that are thriving because of this, absolutely thriving. And I think the opportunities are there. That's, that's all I'll say. I'm seeing it, and it is real, and it's really happening. Oxford and Cambridge are not, are not the only two universities in the UK. I think we also need to see how are our schools preparing those kids to be able to take the step into university and preparing them from the rigors of reading a degree course and providing them with the tools in order to be able to survive. We've seen so many kids drop out of university because they just don't have the tools in order to be able to be successful. So it's about making sure that all of that is provided. And that's why I go back to that well-being piece. That well-being piece is so key in our schools. And I think our schools are doing a really good job in providing those in collaboration with the parents. If, if you actually look at the contextual admissions, thank, thank you, to, to Oxford and Cambridge, they're, they're not as pronounced as you might think. You still get a massive advantage if you've been independently educated. But... If you decide to apply to someone like Mansfield College, they have replicated the state uh, independent ratio. So you've got a virtually zero chance of getting in. But it's, it's not quite as extreme as people say. A lot of it is actually to do with this testing at 11 plus because what, what's happening is that classes are being populated with people who've got very similar profiles because they're all doing the same test. Most of that test is about seeing how fast you process. Um, so I don't think that makes for very interesting people. I, I certainly don't find the people I meet at the top schools nearly as interesting as I did 10, 15 years ago. And Oxford and Cambridge are looking for people who are scholarly. And you're right in saying that there are other universities in the UK. I mean, th thanks for letting me know. But I, I think it is the case that what, what starts at Oxford will, will feed down the system. If I, if I could just look, so we haven't got much time, your 8 to 11 plus question, would you both agree that what was the question? Can you repeat the question? You, you, you're, you're, are you best advised to apply at 8 or 11? It, it's really about confidence, isn't it? And where, where you're at at that stage, uh, how, to what extent you, you're, you're ready at 8, um, or, or you're going to be more ready relative to the competition. 
at, at 11. Would, would you agree with that? Good. Yeah, fine. I think we need a different assessment point in terms of when do we assess. We don't do a driving test at 16. We do a driving test when we are ready. So we need to look at our current assessment systems and look and see, are GCSEs fit for purpose? And I'm talking from a senior school perspective. Are 11 plus uh, right at that particular time? Or do we need something different? So we take in entrance now at year nine, so 13 plus. So we've got our own adaptive test, which is using AI in order to establish what the skills of that particular indiv individual student are. So we can then tailor the curriculum for them. So I think schools now are looking at ways in which they can now personalize learning going forward so that there are much better outcomes for those kids. What, what is personal about AI, which is a double misnomer, isn't it? It's neither artificial nor intelligent. Uh, how, how can you possibly think that using artificial intelligence is a personalized way of assessing someone? Because I think the AI takes out the uh, mundane administrative tasks of marking, etc., and allows that data to be produced, which we can then analyze. How can AI tell if someone's creative, Tom? Because you're a great AI tell enthusiast. Someone, uh, Charles, this is a massive conversation you're starting here. <laughs> do we have another two hours uh, to talk about right, AI? You, you, you I don't know if we do. We have minus deflect, two minutes. But, but um, you know, this, this is the problem, well, I'm, I'm isn't gonna, it? I'm going to answer the chat's question. Uh, so yeah. a, age or 11, I think it's, it's quite subtle, but I think you're probably quietly got, got a bit of a more of a run-up if you come at eight than 11. That's it. And it's not like it will definitely be amazing and everything will be fantastic and brilliant and no problems if you come at eight. But it's just quietly, subtly, you have a more of a run-up. Essentially, that's Correct. thank that's you. It. It's about incremental things. But AI, the I next mean, it's question, such a huge conversation, the next, guys. Next question. Um, We're not going to talk about AI. It, it's um, very simple. I'll, I'll sum it up in 20 seconds. You can bespoke. Now. Oh, sorry. You can bespoke output and resources for individual children using AI, and that's the promise. It's not. It's not literally happening now. But you can. Uh, you know, somebody. You know, Nicholas has a penchant for. Um, you know farming and chickens and chicken eggs and yeah, so the maths yeah. paper is all about chickens and chicken eggs yeah very that, clever. that's how you can um, do that very clever thank you that's the uh, promise next next question please yeah. hello so i wanted to ask about uh, so if there are two kids one from uh, uh, independent school and other from state school both of them having uh, having same scores in gcse and what are the chances if both of them apply to the same to the same university for the same course russell group let's say then what are the chances of one person, who, who is the one person who will get it? Because I'm asking it because uh, independent school normally says that we, um, our kids go to Russell Group, basically that's how we train them. So right. in this case, what are the chances? Who, who is going to win? This so is, this is for you. All for you. Are we talking from a university perspective or from a sixth form perspective? Okay, from a university perspective, you would hope that the best candidate is given the uh, offer, as opposed to you're from independent sector, we're going to give you the, uh, the, call, uh, the um, offer. You would hope that with the work that the universities are doing now, with outreach and going into state schools, etc., they would make sure that the offer is given to the best person. And that's what we would hope for when you're applying for a job. Uh, you, would, you would hope that the employer chooses the person who is going to fit their company in terms of what they can offer rather than what background etc and I think employers now are doing that now where they're removing uh, where what school you went to what university you went to so yeah, that it's much yeah, more yeah, of a level yeah. playing field for those candidates great and but we'll, we'll, we'll carry on afterwards with you so could, yeah yeah We'll continue this. This is just warming up. Can, I feel can, like we're can, can we really getting another, into it. Any more questions? The people in the back feel I can sense any energy from the back. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. It's I feel like we need more time. But I, I think it's, it's really important when you're when you're looking at this to say, well, and you, you've been making this point. University isn't everything, right? So it used to be the case that if you didn't go to Oxford, you wouldn't have the books, you wouldn't have the lectures, you wouldn't have the seminars, you wouldn't have the tutorial. Now, you, it's not artificial intelligence, but you, you, can, you can find all that online. So 
you know, would you deny your child the opportunity to go to a wonderful senior school, which has got all sorts of um, facets about it, which are not necessarily directly related to getting to a particular university, in, in favor of, of, of a very competitive, high-risk shot at a university which might not actually be that good after all, or that different in terms of quality to somewhere you can get into. But there is a problem, there's almost certainly a problem now with the, what were perceived to be, until quite recently, sort of third-tier universities, which are now giving offers of A-star AA, and, and that is concerning. Very much so, and I don't think university is for everyone. Um, I think what we need to do is to allow those kids to make their, their, their choices. We will obviously support them, but there are so many internships out there. We've had a number of students at my place, DLD, who've said, look, I don't want to go to university. I don't want to be saddled with debt. What I want to do is I want to get an internship in the, in the city. So we've teamed up with the likes of Stroders who provide internships to our kids uh, who then bypass university and go on into a career in finance. They're earning more than I am. So, you know, there are so many alternative ways in which we can get to the same point rather than having to go through the university route. So I think we need to be very open-minded that university isn't for everyone. Um, behind yes. you as well. Yeah. Hi. Um, hi, Jason. Hi, hi, Tom. I, I know this is a question for both of you, really, but I know Tom has been making strides in, the, uh, in AI and he's been very open-minded and... I think AI is something that really, either you get on board or going to be left behind. And I think my question is that would you, would you feel that AI is one of the forces in pushing or bridging the gap between private and public more so for a personalized uh, education experience? Very much so. I think we saw that during the pandemic. And I think now if we embrace AI, which I think we all need to, as uh, Anthony Selden said, you know, this is the biggest invention since the printing press. We have got to look at AI and embrace it, not only within our education systems, but we also look at it in the place of work because the roles that our kids now will be going into, the jobs that they're going into, are completely different. And so we need to make sure that AI is fully embraced. Uh, the Prime Minister now is, is, is key about looking at AI and how AI can be adopted within our schools and looking at how AI can be used safely within our schools. And as you said, it will help bridge that gap and possibly level the playing field to a certain extent where we have that individual and personalized okay. learning. I, I'm, I'm all with you, by the way. It's, uh, it's just a question of degree, particularly when it comes to looking at creativity. But this talk is actually on uh, moving from state to private. Does anyone, no, no, we it, can it, continue Jason, this conversation, Jason, but does, does, does anyone have any more that. questions on, on moving I'll, from I'll, one I'll, system to another? I'll just quickly um, answer it because it's it is very, very quickly it's absolutely yeah. about um, yeah. state system uh, right, and, and the private system. And I think the answer to your question is yes. It is going to close the gap. Um, at Cotsmoor, we are really, really passionate about the conversation, not necessarily about the implementation. Can I just clarify? We are interested in the conversation, but we are very circumspect about um, children facing, student facing AI at the moment. Um, but I think it might close the gap. So then you've got to ask yourself, what is a school? What is a school for? But I think you're, you're, you're right. I think the future is going to be very, very interesting in that way. Un un unquestionably. But uh, if we can just move on to one, one more question. Hello. Um, given that there may be a potential change in government in 12 months' time, how are you preparing for that, and how should par parents prepare for potential changes in the fees? So we're talking of principally about uh, potential VAT That's right. being placed on school That's right. fees. Um, Tom, have you cancelled your order for your next Range Rover? Um, how, how am I preparing myself? Um, it's, you're drawing us into a, a bit of a tricky conversation there. Um, multi, multiple, there's, there's a pie chart, and there are many, many parts of the pie chart. So it's a, it's a, it's a smorgasbord of, of, uh, of possibilities. Um, but Irfan's not raising the microphone to his mouth, so I, he's, he's, making, he's forcing me to no, no, babble on about it. I don't actually... Uh, we need to see what it is. You need to see the target and the goal well, let, let's to just actually answer that question. A so, little bit. So, sorry, don't Irfan, try. Irfan might have a better... Uh, okay, just just uh, open up a little bit. But uh, in it, a multifaceted it, it, way. Is there, the there's, a, there's a real concern that school fees are just going to get even more unaffordable, which, you know, it's not your fault because you haven't been in the system, but... So, by it, the way, it, some it, schools it, have nailed it. 
what's going to happen? Um, through bursaries and all, all yeah, sorts of different yeah, things. Yeah. yeah. It is about looking at uh, the way our business model and seeing how we can offset some of those uh, fee increases that are most likely to come our way. But in all honesty, I don't think it's going to happen. I think it's just so complicated from a legislative uh, point of view that it's just going to be too difficult where you're going to end up discriminating against some schools who are SEN providers, for example, neurodiverse schools, and how, wh why are they not being taxed, whereas your bigger schools are? So I think there is, as Tom says, we need to look at the detail, but I, you know, many schools are looking at strategy now and how to offset some of those uh, tax in implications, looking at the mandatory business rates now, which are going to be uh, removed, uh, and charitable status and, and what we need to do. Whether that fee increase is passed on to parents, which we're not going to do because that will alienate a whole host uh, uh, of, our, of our demographic. And some of those parties have got to understand that our parent body are hardworking parents who have made a choice to send their kids to our school and made substantial sacrifices in order to be able to get a decent education. And I think that's the some that needs to be communicated to those parties who are looking at, and I'm trying to be apolitical here, who are trying to implement some of those, I think, detrimental things that are going to, are going to that, harm our sector. I think that's very well spoken, and it's also very good news. And it's not often one hears good news like that. Um, so <laughs> Can I just say, the answer is... You heard it here first. The answer is that um, the schools will be dealing with it with huge empathy and warmth and communication. So don't worry about that. I think you can, be, you can rest assured that there'll be a lot of communication to and fro, warmth and empathy going on. Is inflation more of a concern to you? With, yes. Is inflation more of a concern to you than VAT? Keep, um, keeping costs down? Yeah, I mean, we, we will be looking at keeping costs down and, and those costs are looking at our timetabling, looking at our staffing ratios, uh, looking, at, uh, looking at the offer. And what we don't want to do is to change what we have, uh, which will then have an impact on the outcomes uh, of our students. We may have to tinker, we may have to bite the bullet and, uh, and decide that we cannot offer X, Y and Z. Uh, but again, we need to look at the detail now, uh, and I don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Uh, I know I haven't possibly answered all or your question in, in the detail that you're probably asking for, but I think we're all looking at, you know, what is this going to mean for us, uh, whether we're a charitable status school, whether we are a non, uh, whether we're non-profit school or a profit school, how is that going to impact our parent base? And our parents are key in this. Without them, our schools can't survive. And so what are we going to do in order to make sure that we still are accessible, that we still are approachable? Uh, but Tom says, you know, we are going to deal with this with empathy. We are going to deal with this with warmth and character. Anything that has been thrown at the independent sector in the past, we have managed to, to get through. So I think collectively we are going to find ways. Unfortunately, there are going to be some schools who are not going to be able to cope. Uh, with the demands that uh, the next possible government puts on them. Um, but we are, you know, we're here to try and support as much as we can. Okay, thank you very much. If anyone, we, we've got to wrap it up now, I'm afraid, but if uh, you're not going anyway, if, if, Tom's much better off here rather than his stand, because you've got a lawn on it, haven't you? Um, oh, we've got what? No, we'll, we, 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 we'll hang around. Come we'll up, hang around afterwards. Come, come up here and ask a question. Or, or, or there. Okay. Let's have a chit chat up, up, up here. Very quick, very and quick, very quick. We'll go over there. If we don't finish we're it, being come told up. to go over okay. there. And can I just say very quickly, we, uh, yeah. you were talking about that bridging that gap between uh, you know state and private through uh, AI. If you are here, please go and have a look at Minerva Academy, um, run by yes. Hugh there. Great you man. Know, what he's doing Stand is up, stand up, on, on your feet, please. What he's doing is absolutely yeah. incredible. And there's one uh, entrepreneur there who's looking at you know, um, closing that gap between state and private or the haves and have not. So no, he's, thank he's you very an much. Interesting you. Man. interesting man. Thank you very much. And if, if you any more questions, please come up and I'll, I'll make sure they don't go anywhere. Thank you so much for coming thank and you. listening. Thank you very much, Steve. Yeah.